welcome to wrestlers. And uh, this is where we apply God's word to God's world. So today uh, we're uh, honored to have with us Dr. Robert Wilkin, who is a uh, emeritus professor in Christian history from the uh, University of Virginia. And he's uh, also been involved with several other uh, institutions so I'll read you a little bit of, of his uh, bio, and then we'll uh, share a passage of scripture. Uh, Dr. Wilkin is Professor Emeritus of the University of Virginia, where he was William Keenan Professor of History of Christianity. Wilkin is interested in the history of Christianity and Christian thought, particularly the use of the Bible, how it was read, how it was shaped culture. He earned his PhD from the University of Chicago and has taught at Notre Dame, Fordham, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Dorian University, so he's been around the block. Uh, he is elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is former president of the American Academy of Religion, AAR, and a founding member and president of the North American Patristics Society. He uh, he's written over a dozen books, including Christians as the Romans saw them. The Spirit of Early Christian Thought, Seeking the Face of God, and Remembering the Christian Past. So, uh, this ought to be a fascinating two lectures. He's going to be here with us next week also. Fortunately for us, he now resides in the D.C. area, and so uh, he's not far away, so we can maybe have him come back again frequently. Uh, and he suggested to me a passage of scripture, which is... Uh, in Romans chapter 2, and uh, this is a very interesting passage, I'll read this. Um, all who sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who are justified. When Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law unto themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, to which their own conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the secret thoughts of all. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for bringing us together for this fellowship, for this opportunity to grow and learn, and we thank you for our speaker, and we pray that you'll inspire him and, and help uh, him to inspire us to, to continue to uh, grow and to help others to pass on what we have learned uh, to the, the city and around the world. So we thank you now for this time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, well, he asked me the physical passage to read, and I suggested that one, and I realized it's not the kind of thing you can just digest. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason I was interested in it is because of the phrase, your conscience, there's witness within conscience. I'm sure that for many of you, as for me, it has been something of a, a surprise and an awakening to have religious freedom, so to speak, in our country. It's one of the things that we simply take for granted. And uh, yet, in recent years, recent decades, it's all over the news. There are court cases and there are books written on it, and it's a, it's a hotly disputed issue. Give me a good example just of uh, how serious this is. I think it was last summer that the <coughs> United States Commission on Civil Rights had a document in which when it referred to religious freedom and religious liberty, it put the words in what we call scare quotes. That's when you put quotes around a word, it means that the word's got some kind of meaning that's going to hit you hard. And the reason 
what they did is they said that religious freedom has become for some people a code word for discrimination, for intolerance, for racism, for sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, for Christian supremacy or other forms of intolerance. <coughs> and so he sees, or the commission sees, uh, religious freedom as in conflict with anti-discrimination laws. Now, concretely what that means is whether religious communities, that is churches, institutions supported by churches, particularly schools, appropriate schools and of course high schools, have the right to determine who shall teach or minister on the basis of their religious convictions. <coughs> or does their conviction about who can teach in their schools get trumped by regulations having to do with religious discrimination? The most uh, uh, egregious example, and one which is now very much in the news, has to do with LGBT. LGBT. Does a church school have the right to say that if one of their teachers marries a person of the same sex, or that that person is gay, that they will not be able to teach in their school? Does the religious rights of the particular church trump the anti-discrimination laws? Of course, we know that a big issue has to do with contraception for the Catholic Church and politicists and courts and so forth. Um, I mentioned these cases. I'm not going to talk about that. That's not my topic. I want to let you know that this is something that's very much in the air. I only want to illustrate that, that something that seems so self-evident <coughs> for decades, for the lives of every one of us in this room here, and are being challenged by new laws, by the courts, by books and articles. For example, a few years ago, a professor at the University of uh, uh, Chicago wrote a book, Why Tolerate Religion? Why should religion be given a special status in our society? And he argues that it should not be, and that Western democracies are wrong to single out religious liberty for special legal protections. If you think about that for a moment, it only goes against the Bill of Rights, but it goes against everything that this country has stood for. But that's the kind of air that now we are breathing because people are uh, making such arguments. And then if you think of what the consequences would be were that argument to succeed, well, of course, church like this. There may not be anything right at the moment that's rubbing here, but I can assure you it will come in a new time. So my aim over the next two Sundays is not to discuss these current debates. That's not my way. I'm a historian and a theologian. Um, but I want at least to apprise you and just to remind you what the First Amendment says. Congress shall make no law respecting or establish the establishment, restricting and establishment of religion, or, and the second phrase is the most important, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And does that apply only to say what goes on in your sanctuary here, or does it apply to institutions that are supported by the churches? Enough for the present. It was once assumed that religious freedom was a work of the Enlightenment. What that means is, is that it was something that arose primarily in the 18th century, 17th and 18th century, and was primarily the result of the thinking of philosophers. The philosophers who were really quite distant from Christianity. They may have been deistic, but they weren't genuine, traditional Christians. And the argument goes something like this. The Reformation was the problem, because the Reformation was fueled by people with deep religious convictions. But as the Reformation spread, Christians began to persecute other Christians, <coughs> whether it was Catholics persecuting Lutherans, or Calvinists persecuting anti-Trinitarians, the famous case of Calvin. And whether it was the Dutch suffering, I mean, excuse me, the, the French Calvinists in France, who we call the Huguenots, suffering from French rule, 
or whether it was in England, with the Church of England persecuting <coughs> both Catholics and Evangelicals, Baptists, and Puritans. And the argument goes like this, that as these divisions harden, Protestants and Catholics and others faced each other on the battlefield. We had religious war. A half century of bloody conflict, the so-called wars of religion, was set in motion by the men of the 17th century. <coughs> Men with greater wisdom and less religious fervor came on the scene, and the fanaticism of religious believers gave way to the cool reason of the philosophers. Armed with notions about the superiority of reason to faith, skeptical of received truth and distrustful of religious claims and institutions, Jefferson, of course, or he's not an originator. These enlightened thinkers, that's what the enlightenment means, forged a new set of ideas about toleration and religious freedom. Through their labors, the modern idea of liberty of conscience was born. That's the conventional view. In other words, religious beliefs, when firmly held, lead inevitably to social conflict and to war. And the solution is to disarm religious communities and to remove religion from the public square. Make it something that people do in private. So religion is not something we do in private. It's a very, very public thing. We don't just do it in our homes or in enclosed buildings. Religion has all sorts of implications for how people live, how they educate, what values. So, the traditional view is that religious freedom basically arises from non-religious people. And what I'm going to say in the next couple of times is that religious freedom basically is the work of Christians and has its roots in the Bible and in the earliest Christian thinkers. I'm going to give you a few examples to make that point. Today I'm going to talk more about the very early period, first couple of centuries, and then next time I'll talk about the Reformation and the period of the end. The end. And one thing you got to remember is this. When you start talking about religion in the ancient world, religion, for the people who lived in the ancient world and in the Roman Empire, religion was an affair of the community as a whole. It was not a matter of private association. It was what everybody did, and it permeated public life. Because piety toward the gods nurtured a sense of loyalty and social union among men and women, and taught citizens the virtues of justice and civic duty. The public rituals, these would be ceremonies, in which everyone from the priests, who were really civic officials, and the people who participate, the great, the great religious act in antiquity was the sacrificing of an animal. And then the eating of uh, the roasted meat. All of these things were permeated by religion. The civic calendar and the civil calendar were one. The coins people used to buy and sell. The statues went past in the city. Civic holidays and victory celebrations were vehicles for the expression of religious sentiments. We call that today civil religion, the kind of thing that kind of surfaces on the 4th of July and more of day, to a certain extent, Thanksgiving. Which, you know, for us is, is very weak. It may be very deep in our soul, but it's not, it's not deep religious. But not for the, for the ancient. This meant that everyone was expected to participate in the public civil rights. But the Christians came along and they said, no. We believe in one God. God who is transcendent creator of all things. The God of everyone. And we believe that your gods are idols. And for us to participate, pinch of incense on a flame, is an act of idolatry. And we have a number of instances of this. Um, so when Christians were brought before the local magistrate, they were asked, 
why do you obstinately observe your own rights and not practice what we Romans practice? And of course, some sit up and said, we will not practice what you practice. And we call them the first martyrs. Of which there were many in the early church. So they thought, as Christian thinkers paid attention to this, that they were being treated unjustly. And they began to make arguments for why they should be free to practice their religion independently of the public religion, independently of any sort of state control. And no one had ever really done that. The only exception to that was the Jews. And the Jews, that's a kind of a long and involved history. It basically had to do with earlier relations between the Romans when Jewish people had their own nation. And as they began to move around the Mediterranean world, the Romans made provisions for them to live in their cities and to follow their own rights. For example, keeping the Sabbath or eating pork, <coughs> which the Romans found ridiculous. Why shouldn't you eat pork? And a number of other things. But the Jews were a single people, one nation. They believed in the one God, but they were one nation, one people. The Jews, however, preached out to, I mean, the Christians preached out to everybody. So they broke whatever pattern had been established. And along comes, around the year 200, a man by the name of Tertullian. If you've ever heard that name, Tertullian is one of the church fathers. Church fathers are those great teachers. He said that I was founder of the American, National, American Society of Patristic Studies. Patristic, those of you who remember your Latin, pater, patristic, the church. What they really mean is the great authoritative teachers who lived in the early church. For us in the West, the premier one would be St. Augustine. So tell you, it's very interesting because he was the first to write about Christianity in Latin. And Latin became, of course, the language of Western Christianity. Right up through the Reformation, until Calvin wrote in Latin, Luther wrote in Latin, many other people wrote in Latin. And he uh, wrote a treatise. He lived in Carthage. Carthage is present-day Tunisia. So if you ever go to Tunis, you can go just about 10 miles out along the coast and you can visit the ruins of Carthage. And Carthage had suffered a number of persecutions. In fact, one of the earliest texts we have that describe the persecution of Christians is the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicity, two women. A very, very powerful story. <coughs> and Tertullian was there when that happened. And then there was another persecution. So he took upon himself to write a letter to the local governor, the one who was behind the persecution, defending the right of Christians to practice their religion. And here's what he said. It is a person's human right and inborn capacity to worship whatever he intends, where there really is whatever he wills or wishes to do. The religious practice of one person neither harms nor helps another. It is no part of religion to coerce religious practice. For it is by free choice, not coercion, that we should be led to religion. Little footnote. Not an interesting footnote. Thomas Jefferson knew that passage. And in his notes on the state of Virginia, in which he discusses religion, he wrote it out in his own hand in Latin, in his own personal copy at the bottom of the page. I actually saw this um, in the rare book room at the University of Virginia Library. When I got back to D.C., I went to the Library of Congress to the railroad room there. I knew that he had something of Tertullian in his library, and I called up the book, and I brought it up. I don't know if you've ever been in that room, the lovely room, they put it 
cradled this way, they bring out this kind of uh, beads that are in a thing here so you can you know, don't mess up the pages or fold them over. So I opened it up to this treatise, to Scotland, chapter 2. Tertullian had underlined the passage and put a big X in the margin. Now, I'm not going to make the point that Tertullian was influenced by, I mean, Jefferson by Tertullian. It's a much more complicated story than that. But somehow that text was still current in 18th century America. And Jefferson learned about it. I can't find out high. I write the Jefferson scholars and they don't care. They don't know anything. Nobody's been able to answer my question. I mean, top Jefferson scholars. And I'm not a Jefferson. Anyway, so the text was current. And I'm writing now, I'm able to show how current it was, how many people had been quoting it in the 16th and the 17th century. And let me read it again to you so you get the main point. It is a human right, or it is just, and it is a capacity, a power, capability that is inborn, natural, <clears throat> that human beings are able to worship what they wish. The religious practice of one person does not harm another. That's what Jefferson liked. He picked that particular line up. I mean, that's what he did. He did. It is no part of religion to coerce religious practice. For it is by free choice, not coercion, that should be led to religion. My point very simply is, this is the basis, this set of ideas, of what we know as religious freedom. That religion cannot be coerced, and that it is a matter of free choice. No. Now, where do these ideas come from? They come from the Bible. I'll give you just a few passages. Paul, a man believes with his heart. In other words, belief comes from within. Prophet Joel, yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. That's second nature to us. I mean, you've heard that said from your pulpit year after year after year after year. Religion comes from within religious belief. Oh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. God expects us love. But where does love come from? It comes from within. Psalm 51. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart of God. Thou wilt not despise. Now, so Julian is writing to a Roman governor. So it makes no sense to quote the Bible. And you make other kind of arguments. But that's what lies behind it. And if you read to Tertullian's writings, you can see that that's what lies behind it. So the first point then is that religious belief arises within a person. And, with, and what is within cannot be coerced by external <coughs> means. You can't force someone to believe what comes from the heart. There have to be other means to get them to change. That's the core idea. If one does give in against what the heart believes, what we call that simulation, hypocrisy, saying with the lips what one does not hold in the heart. And that goes against everything. Scriptures teach, and that we as Christians believe. The second point is that early Christians <coughs> believe in the dignity of the human person created in the image of God. I was going to have Mr. Armisen read uh, Genesis 1:26, which is the text that speaks about being made in the image and likeness of God. Tertullian understood the meaning of this, and he quotes it several times.
times in the play, that human beings are endowed with freedom. <coughs> to be created in the image of God means that we are free. We are not bound. We are not mechanical. He says, man was created by God free, with power to choose and power to act. There is no clearer indication in him of God's image and similitude than this. Well, he argues that Christians are endowed with freedom. And that's the corollary, then, of the freedom to choose to believe what one wishes. <clears throat> As God's creatures made in his image, they then are the master of their will and actions. Freedom is a mark of our dignity in our power to obey or to discipline. <clears throat> Human beings then can resist paying homage to the gods who are not gods. And he quotes, render to Caesar the things that are of Caesar and to God the things that are of God. To Caesar, he says, we offer our money, but to God, ourselves. <clears throat> Third point. Christians learn from the Bible that human beings have a conscience. Term conscience is a very interesting word. <clears throat> Those of you who remember your Latin, it comes from sciencia. Oh, here's the right one. Oh, you can go up there. Knowledge, knowing. And con, which means knowing with. So it, it's a knowledge that is accessible to others. And so when Paul uses that in that passage from Romans 2, he says, your conscience bearing witness, that means that, that something from within is potentially known by others. So then, uh, in, the, in the ancient world, they talked about a good conscience. A good conscience was, one, a person who knew the rightness of what they did and therefore could not be Accused. There's a beautiful story in the, uh, um, the book of Susanna. It's in the Apocryphal Bible. Just the real Bible. Mm -hmm. Protestant reformers made a big mistake. That, that, that the Bible they church for 1,600 years. Anyway, it's a beautiful book. Susanna was a beautiful young woman. And she used to bathe in the garden. Said, and um, and she then was in love with the young man. And so they claimed that he had had relations with her and tried to defame her, which we were talking about. And she was executed. And she stood firm. And another very famous Christian writer, Ambrose, bishop in the fourth century, wrote about that. And he says the reason she could stand so firm is because she had a bona conscientia, a good conscience. She knew within what she had done. And that was something that then was accessible to others. Not to knowledge with. So that's basically the background of the term. And it comes in the Bible in a number of very interesting places. <coughs> the most notable one is the one from Romans 2 where he says that Jews, even though they do not have the Jew, excuse me, Gentiles do not have the Jewish law, they have conscience. And the conscience within bears witness to them right or wrong. And then later, in 1 Corinthians 10, he's talking about people who were eating food offered to idols. So the food that was offered to idols, <coughs> well, you roast a whole bull. What do you do with all that? So it was sold in the markets. And the question was whether a Christian could eat that meat. Polluted. And Paul said it's a matter of conscience. And you shouldn't blame someone because their conscience leads them to do something so the word is in the New Testament. But what happens is that Christians pick it up <coughs> and turn it in a somewhat 
different direction. And again, our friend Tertullian <coughs> writes a treatise called On the Testimony of the Soul. And he says, the testimony of the soul is an inner voice that comes from God, and he identifies that with conscience. So conscience then becomes this mysterious <coughs> voice within us that tells us what we should do and what we should not do. If we ahead of the story, we'll get to that next week. What happens in the 16th century is that people begin to say, let us say, when the Lutherans are persecuting the Catholics, or when the French are persecuting the Calvinists, they appeal to the freedom, the liberty of conscience. And that's where we get the phrase of the conscience. And as far as I can see, the first time it is used, an extraordinary instance uh, in this period, is in the 1520s, the city of Nuremberg in Germany is being transformed into a Lutheran city. Immediately after the Reformation. And what they did is they got rid of the priests, sent them on their way, began to change the liturgy, began to have different kind of preaching, and dismantled the monasteries. And so they went to work on a Franciscan monastery. But it happens that a woman, a Franciscan sister by the name of Caritas Love Perkheimer writes a journal. And she describes what they do week by week. They would send in Lutheran clergy to the monastery to preach to them. And the sisters with cotton in their ears. So they wouldn't have to hear. And she says what they are doing is they are denying us our liberty of conscience. So in a curious way, it's with the Catholic, which means that it's not that she's Catholic, it's just this is what Christians believe. You find the same thing in Lutheran law that you find in John Calvin and the other people. So liberty of conscience then merges with these other two ideas. You can't coerce religion. And that religion comes from, from within. And the dignity of the human person. So these ideas that are elaborated in the early church by other writers, names that you wouldn't know. One of them is Lactantius, another Latin writer around the year 300. But most important, they appear in one of the most significant documents in the whole history of our Western civilization what is sometimes called the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan, it's not really an edict, it's actually a letter that the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian emperor, and another emperor, that is the two co-emperors, wrote saying that people should have freedom to choose their own religion. This is basically drawing on Tertullian's ideas and Lactantius's ideas. And it then is enshrined in an official document. And interesting, the document says, because Constantine was concerned about the Christians, he says, not only the Christians, but everyone else. Well, the downside of the story is that the Christians didn't follow what they taught. And so once Christianity became the established religion of the Roman world, and of course of our whole Western society, they began to do what the Romans had done and to suppress others and to persecute others. And of course, those who suffered the most were the heretics, but also the Jews. So it, it's, it's not a happy story. However, what had been written in the early centuries was never forgotten. And so you have some <coughs> strong exceptions. One of them is uh, one of the great popes, Gregory the Great, around the year 600. 
he discovers that some bishops are forcing Jews to be baptized. And he writes and says, you can't do that because you can't force a person to believe. And then other writers in the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, they all say you can't force a person to believe. And then there are some examples in the Middle Ages where uh, uh, you know, theological teachers uh, got into trouble because of something they had written and then were called up to explain. And they said, unless you can prove to me from the scriptures and from the church's tradition that when I say it's false, I'm going to continue to hold it. And they appeal to their conscience. So the point is that by the time the Reformation comes along, this is deeply embedded, even though Christians had adopted uh, pretty much the same ideas. They were never forgotten, however. And centuries later, during the Reformation, <coughs> Christians, learned Christians, began to read the ancient texts again. And fortunately, because of the Renaissance, the Renaissance was a great discovery of the classical tradition, and by the year 1500, all the learned people were absolutely fluent, not only in Latin, but in Greek, and they began to publish the texts. <clears throat> and so they read these texts, and they said, my goodness, what applied to the Romans now applies to us, except now it's the Christians who are the bad guys. That is, the Christians on the other side, you know, the Protestants against the Catholics. So with fresh eyes then, these ideas then came to new life. And conscience, and then in that core religion, but it was out of the heart, began to be infiltrated. And so next week what I'd like to do is to show just how that happened, and then where it was leading. And I'll begin with the early Reformation, and I'll go into um, England, and then the 17th century, great English thinkers that lead up to John Locke. And the basic point I want to make is that everything, John Locke, of course, is the great <coughs> voice for religious toleration in the human life. He wrote a letter on toleration, which is very, very important. Locke is wholly dependent on all these early Christian ideas, except he strips them of their Christian foundation. And he argues strictly on philosophical grounds, reasonable grounds. And that's how it comes to Jefferson, Madison, all the others. All right, so that gave you plenty of time for discussion now. You've been very attentive here, so I appreciate that. Maybe I'll get a little more coffee here. As a teacher of American literature, I just keep hearing the sole superior instance occurred to him alone, Emily Dickinson and Thoreau, and his use of the majority of one, the whole uh, taking up of conscience in a non-specifically Christian exactly. tradition as being just so quintessentially where we should, you know, <laughs> our foundation. Right, and as I and say, it's interesting to hear it's Latin. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it, and the point is, is that you know, an idea like that, even someone like the Thoreau, you know, clearly that's where the roots are. Yeah. And, um, and I'll say the next day is that what that means is religious freedom is really about religion and about God. And Thoreau, even though he may not talk that way, basically you have to assume that there's something other than just you. Yes, sir. There's a theme that holds all this together. When does the Mediterranean basin move from speaking primarily Greek to Latin? This is a very important thing because the language changes at the time of Ambrose, the Vandals coming across the right. center. I, I'd like to hear your views here on this. Well, um, <clears throat> it never changed. It, there was a basic linguistic division between the Western Mediterranean, which meant 
Rome and parts of uh, um, what's it, Croatia and that area in there, um, and then of course North Africa, that was Latin speaking, Augustine, Tertullian came from, from North Africa. But once you got over to uh, Greece and then further east of Greece, Asia Minor, and then down in Egypt, the language was Greek. Now the local language was something quite different. But Greek was the majority language of the city of Rome itself, I think, at least well, about 400. I don't think it was ever the majority, that there were a lot of immigrants there. And the reason why Paul writes his letter in Romans in Greek is because he was writing to people who most likely were Greek immigrants. So it, it was widely used in Roman in Rome. But the official documents during the early empire were almost all in Latin. If you look at the, the great account of, uh, of the uh, rule of Augustus, it's all in Latin. And of course, the, the great historians, Tacitus, and Suetonius, they, say they wrote in Latin. One of the things that your, your question does um, remind me of is that what I've been telling is largely a Western story. Um, there are some signs in Eastern Christianity that means the Byzantine world, but basically it's a Western story, which means um, that that's something that Western Christianity has contributed, which then, of course, the United States is Western is Christianity. This church is Western. Church, whereas when I was driving over here, I passed by the Greek Orthodox Church. They belong to a completely different cultural um, religious world. Yes, sir. Don't we all go back, however, to Daniel? It seems to me like the notion of religious liberty started five or six hundred years earlier when Daniel says, I will not worship your gods, I will worship mine. Ruler says, In an alliance, Dan. You're absolutely right. And, um, Tertullian quotes that. I mean, he does. Um, and there are other cases um, uh, under uh, in the Book of Esther. We have Jews standing up. Um, so there's no question that it's a much deeper thing than that. But the, the point I want to try to make is that you know you have to have something that's going to give shape to these ideas, and they didn't take shape prior and primary reason was is because the monotheism prior to Christianity was the work of the Jewish people. And so the issue was the Jewish people and their status, not a religion which really embraced everybody. But you're absolutely right. Um, and, and, and those stories are cited in the 16th and the 17th century. Yes, sir. Yeah, in the passage of Tertullian that you read, there was something that troubled me a bit, and I'm, I think it said something like, um, "The uh, one man's worship does not influence another person's worship. They're, they're yeah, so huh? that they're 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 yeah, private." That. And you know, the motto of this class is applying God's word to God's world. We have the the idea that our religion is not merely a private exercise, but it extends into applications into the world, and, and it influences the world in some way. It should change not only us, but our surroundings. So I'm wondering, wh how do you respond? Well, I mean, he, he's, he's not addressing that question. What, what he's simply saying is that we as a Christian community if we do things different religiously than what the whole society does, we're not hurting anybody. I mean, there's no question about the missionary impulse within early Christianity. But this is simply a recognition that in religious matters, and this is what Jefferson liked about this quotation, in religious matters, what we do does not harm anybody. Jefferson example is you believe in one God or 20 gods, that's fine. But if you pick my pocket, that's another matter altogether. And so that's really what he means here. Um, and it's, um, one could say that maybe it goes too far, but you know, you have to read statements in context 
and the, the, the push, the, the pressure of the statement of the sentence is, is really having to do with uh, fundamental human capacity. He calls it a right. I, I don't think that term right should be pushed because the term for us right has a lot of other connotations. I mean, I, when I translate it, I, I tend to, it is only just. Uh, rather than to use a loaded word like rights. Rights means something that uh, the state protects. He's, he's not talking, he, he has no legal foundation for this. And I think it's just, um, another thing that's part of this statement that's important is, and he'll say this elsewhere. Oh, by the way, I, I didn't quote it. Actually, in another word, his apology, it's a larger work in defense of Christian, he uses the word religious freedom. So the first time the term enters the vocabulary of our Western civilization is in Tertullian. Libertas religionis, liberty of religion. Extraordinary. He, he says that. Um, and as I said, it's amazing how many people quote this passage again and again and again. William Penn quotes it. In his book, The Great Conscience of Liberty, The Great Case for Liberty of Conscience, two great English theologians, John Owen, if you know that name, he was the 17th century, Jeremy Taylor, it's all over the place. Um, so, there was something there that they knew, and of course what it gave them was a very early authority to text. And, and that line you pick out of which Jefferson liked is not the one that they focus on. Yes, ma'am. Maybe wrongly, but when I think of evangelism, I think of um, helping people understand the Word of God, know what the Bible says. In some ways, almost a very cognitive um, understanding. You're talking about the heart and conscience, which to me is a different emphasis, more of the modeling and how one feels to change someone's heart about religion. Would you just comment on that? Well, uh, my experience is different. People are not persuaded by argument. Um, <laughs> They are persuaded by witness, by life, by love, by feelings. Um, young man falls in love, but he's drawn to his wife's religion. Um, we have a wonderful aunt who just showered love on you. And that really teaches. So I now Christianity has always been concerned about the cognitive side. The great line that's quoted over and over and over again is a quotation from the Bible from Isaiah, but it's it's from the Greek translation of the Bible. Is if you believe, you will understand. So belief pre precedes understand. So argument comes <coughs> after after you have started to believe, and you have questions. I wrote a whole book on this called The Spirit of Early Christian Thought, and that's what I say in the first paragraph in the introduction, quoting Augustine. So there's no doubt about the role of arguments, reason. But I think uh, what moves people initially is, is, is quite different than that. In most cases. In most cases. Credibut and Tavadama. I believe so that I might know. Credibut and Tavadama. Yeah. Yeah. Credibut and Yeah, that, that's the quotation from Isaiah in the Greek and then the Latin translation. Um, and, and that Augustine loved that. And it's, it's true. And belief Springs from from deeper deeper things within us. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Just I had a question just about the conception of conscience. 
historically and uh, seems to have two aspects. One is the prospective kind of going forward, the conscious view of God, um, the little voice told me, and versus the retrospective, sort of the judge, conscious as judge of my prior acts. Um, how, is that, are both those notions in the definition? You're right on the money on this. The, the term conscience, <coughs> prior to the advent of Christianity, was almost wholly retrospective. It was knowledge of something that had been done. <coughs> and Christianity, and already right about the same time as Tertullian, I mean, it's, it's present in, in, in Paul, but you get a more developed um, explanation in the commentary on the passage from Paul by the other great thinker at that time, Origen of Alexander, the great Greek thinker. And he says, conscience has both sides. It has <coughs> the side of looking back, and it has the side of what you should do, the judgment about future action. And it's the judgment about future action that becomes dominant in the Western use of the term. And that's the way most people understand it today. What uh, in English, uh, we have different words, but in uh, some of the uh, Latin-based European languages, the term conscience and consciousness are the same word. But in English, conscience usually is prospective, and consciousness is retrospective. So that's a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, ma'am. At the beginning, you mentioned religious freedom. People hear that as a code word for discrimination. No, the Civil Rights Commission did, and the guy, yeah. Castro is his name. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel this more and more in our own country, in our own culture. Would you talk about that? Well, I, I think I said uh, what I wanted to say is that a term which has been honored celebrated as one of the great gifts and enshrined in the First Amendment is now put into question as though it's being used to support prejudice. And that's because we live in a society where Christianity is under suspicion by many of the people who are running our society and have no religious practice themselves and have no interest and really have very little respect for religion. And that's why uh, I think we have to fight that uh, uh, at every turn. And when people write a book such as Why Tolerate Religion, uh, you realize it's gone pretty far. One thing he didn't mention was, are any of you here readers of First Things? Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. Well, I'm the chairman of the board of the Institute that publishes First Things. I'm very much involved with that. So if you're interested in an informed religious perspective on what's going on in our country on these matters, I think First Things is a magazine to read. I mean, just put First Things in, it'll come up immediately. You can see our website. And I should have brought along a couple of copies here. Well, I'll bring them along next week. Okay. Maybe I'll call the office and give me a bunch of forms here. That you <laughs> mail forms here. But, um, you know, if you... Anyway, it's, it's, it's not... Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's ecumenical. And so it's Jewish uh, interest in it. Right, and so forth. Um, but it's an attempt at a fairly high... And it's kind of, but that kind of a magazine with pretty high subscription. Uh, subscriber base. We have about 28,000. Well, Richard John Newhouse is, like, was my older friend. We met when I was 16 and he was 17. <laughs> and uh, he will have died in January, eight years ago. Eight more years than he has. There's a good biography of him, by the way, by Randy Moore. He was a founder. He was a Lutheran pastor, as I was. 
somebody else has a question. Yes, sir. I don't mean to clutter up the occasion, but one big topic that we need to be thinking about is Christianity comes into the world where the Roman cult was already fading, and it gets worse and worse from that account. So, it, well, this is the picture I was taught. Please correct me if I've got it wrong. Yeah, I don't think that's um, a fair assessment. Um, a book written a few years ago by Robin Lane Fox, and <clears throat> it pretty much showed, you know, that that, that wasn't the case. The, the difficulty is judging Roman religion by a Christian understanding of religion and not recognizing what this kind of civic religion actually meant to people. And I, I doubt whether it would have had the, the persecution of Christians, you know, if it had been really in decline. And furthermore, uh, at the intellectual level, what had happened is that the um, philosophical thinkers had begun to move toward another, a, a, a deeper understanding of one God. So there was some sympathy for Christianity. Um, but I, I think, you know, religion is practiced by the people in, in the city who's still pretty vibrant and uh, Christians had to deal with that. Uh, but it was a different kind of religion. It, 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 was, it was different from you know, what we assume. Because you know, it, it had little to do with belief, but with doctrine. It had to do with rituals and the ceremonies. It had to do with you know, sensibilities and attitudes. So there was a piety, a form of devotion, but it, it was of a different, a different sort. And um, so it's easy to read you know, Roman writers and say, well, you know, they're not very deeply religious people, and they probably weren't in our sense, but they, they're religious in their sense. Um, I wrote a book called The Christians as the Romans Saw Them, one of my first books. The, the Romans what? The Christians as the Romans Saw Them. They're still in print. And... Um, the point I made there is uh, we're talking about a genuine religious feeling and sensibility. The book was, let's try to understand how they viewed Christianity from their world rather than from our world. And I self-consciously followed that out through the whole book. And it's amazing, you know, how fresh a perspective that gives. And it's used all over the country now. So, College classroom. I still get a check every year from there. <laughs> <laughs> Not a big one, but we sell three thousand copies a year. <laughs> so, so the, with the respect of discrimination in religion, Howard, who sits beside me, often reminds us that Presbyterians could not vote in Virginia until some particularly late date. So it's not new. Actually, they couldn't even stay here. The cabins were burned down, and it was solved by appealing the Quakers in Philadelphia, right, to, to the governor, and say, you've got to let these ruffians in, because they can, only they can keep the French and Indians out of the West. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, I know that story very well, and I lived in Virginia all these years, and of course, the, uh, <clears throat> one of the most famous instances is um, uh, when James Madison um, heard about uh, a revival meeting in Orange County <clears throat> and some of the uh, local clergy came in and whipped the preachers because they were not legally allowed. And it was because of that, it's very interesting, I'll maybe mention it next time, is that when he was given the document, <clears throat> he was a young man, on religious freedom for um, the state of Virginia. He said, we have, to, we have to strike the word toleration. And he wanted stronger language, which was then accepted, insisted on, namely, that we're really talking about a fundamental right. Toleration is a benevolence, it's a forbearance, it's an indulgence of something you don't like. That's a quite different thing than religious freedom. But it also 
fallen apart by 1774. Mm. Falls Church gets down with four families within yeah. two years. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. Oh, we are out of time. I just wanted to thank you for this, and we're glad you're coming back. We've opened up a lot of questions, and we want to have a chance to resolve some next week. So thank you again. Thank you very much.